humanity's values in to refresh your course. Let's stand up and we'll sing it together twice. be your prayer. You may be seated. As I was looking this up, I found out I was one year old when this was written. So this has been around a long time, Pastor. <laughs> well, there goes our preacher. Now what are we going to do? <laughs> Thank you. Another, another blessed evening. Let's pray together. God, we certainly rejoice in you again tonight. Count it a privilege to be in the house of God and to finish out this day well uh, with uh, the purpose of worshiping our great God and our Savior. We love the testimonies of your people and we love rehearsing that point in time in our, our lives when we saw our desperate need of Christ because of our sin and called on that most wonderful name and trusted in this one who loved himself, lo loved us and gave himself for us. And, and uh, of course, it's the, the living Christ who offers to us salvation and, and then... Um, you absolutely transform our lives, and we rejoice over these things. No wonder the prophet Isaiah wrote, I will greatly rejoice in the Lord. My soul shall be joyful in my God, for he hath clothed me with the garments of salvation. He has covered me with his robe of righteousness. It's the greatest thing in all of life. And then we've sung together and uh, we have been blessed and challenged by such and certainly appropriate uh, that we would, uh, with our last song, be reminded of how important it is that we live our lives now with a view to eternity and what will count therein. And so that is a good segue into our study of the Word of God and we're reminded uh, every time we open up the pages of the book that this is one of the very unique and special ways in which we can communicate our love to you, and that is by being good students of the Word of God and especially having hearts that beat after your truth and desire to incorporate into our lives um, what you have shown us. So be blessed again tonight as uh, we look into your Word, we pray for Jesus' sake. Amen. Uh, we are back tonight with our study in 2 Thessalonians because it's been two weeks uh, since we have been engaged with the study. I would like to uh, read the section that we are in the process of working our way through. 
I am referring to 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, verses 1 through 12. So find that if you would please and then follow along as I read 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, uh, verses 1 through 12. Now we beseech your brethren by the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ and by the gathering together, our gathering together unto him, that ye be not soon shaken in mind or be troubled neither by spirit nor by word nor by letter as from us, as that the day of the Lord is present. Let no man deceive you by any means, for that day shall not come except there come the falling away first, and that man of sin be revealed the son of perdition, who opposes and exalts himself above all that is called God or that is worshipped so that he as God sits in the temple of God showing himself that he is God. Remember ye not that when I was yet with you I told you these things. And now you know what restraineth that he might be revealed in his time. For the mystery of iniquity doth already work. Only he who now hinders will continue to hinder until he be taken out of the way. And then shall that wicked one be revealed, whom the Lord shall consume with the spirit of his mouth and shall destroy with the brightness of his coming, even him whose coming is after the working of Satan with all power and signs and lying wonders, and with all deceivableness of unrighteousness in them that perish, because they received not the love of the truth that they might be saved. And for this cause God shall send them strong delusion that they should believe the lie, that they all might be judged who believed not the truth but had pleasure in unrighteousness. Uh, God has been teaching us not just broadly about the tribulation period, but specifically about the man of sin who runs wild in it. We are learning, have been learning, and will continue to learn about the Antichrist. I remind you that with a view to the tribulation period that you and I will not be here. Everyone who has put their faith and trust in Christ since the day of Pentecost will be snatched out of here. Uh, It's called the rapture. And as the church is snatched out, so too will the restraining ministry of the Holy Spirit of God And that paves the way for the seven-year tribulation period, the beginning of which is marked by two events. One, the apostasy, the turning away, the falling away, and two, the revelation of the man of sin, the Antichrist. Now, we've covered quite a bit of biblical turf in regard to him Uh, We left off our study with verse 9. We made some observations there. Let me remind you of that even by way of rereading. Verse 9, even him whose coming is after the working of Satan with all power and signs and lying wonders. When you first read that, it probably uh, frightens you a little bit, and it probably should because it is a retestament to the power of, of our spiritual enemy. We know and we're glad for this and we've been reminded of it really throughout the course of the day that Satan exercises only under the sovereign and controlling hand of God and yet we have been prompted in the past and continue to be prompted time and time again and impressed with the fact that our spiritual enemy is very, very powerful. He is the strong man. And yet, greater is he that is in us than he that is in the world. But it's frightening as you read a verse like verse 9. We noted a number of things with verse 9, including the fact that the Antichrist is the full manifestation of Satan. We've used the word mimic many times in the course of our study of late that the Antichrist will mimic everything in regard to the Christ. And even this concept that as the Lord Jesus Christ, and we know that it's different with Christ because he is the perfect manifestation of the God. But even with that, here is the Antichrist mimicking the Christ. And we're prompted to recognize, even by the writings of Paul here, that the Antichrist is in turn the full manifestation of Satan. 
and we have been re-impressed with the fact that the Antichrist will be functioning um, with the power of Satan and at one juncture uh, during the trib, namely the midpoint, he will actually be possessed by him. Now we pick up our study tonight with verse 10, I am reading. And with all deceivableness of unrighteousness in them that perish, because they receive not the love of the truth that they might be saved. That phrase, the deceivableness of unrighteousness is striking, and it actually will be our focus tonight. But before we get to that, a couple of other things here in verse 10, please. We have people perishing here. Again, it's striking. This is with a view to the tribulation period. And so as we think about the tribulation period and the series of judgments that unfold, you know that there are primarily three series of judgments that unfold. The seal judgments, the trumpet judgments, and the bowl judgments. And you know that these judgments are devastating in character and you are aware of the fact that many people perish during the tribulation period. Paul is reminding us of that. You might be interested in these stats. The seal judgments are the first of the judgments that unfold. They take place early on um, with the tribulation period. And we know according to Revelation chapter 6 and verse 8 that the seal judgments result in the death of one quarter of the population of the world. It's hard for us to wrap our minds around that. And here's a statistic for you. If there are 7.5 billion, and we're growing by the way, but if there are 7.5 billion people in the world, then that means 1.88 billion people are killed with just the sealed judgments. And then as you continue to follow that through the book of Revelation, that's again at the early stages of the tribulation period. And then when you arrive at the sixth trumpet judgment, you can read about that on your own in Revelation chapter 9 and verse 18. You have another 1.85 billion people that are killed which comes to a total of 3.7 billion, which is half of the world's population. Say goodbye to half of the world's population. And that's not even counting the bold judgments, which a strong case could be made for them being the most severe of the judgments. It is, by the way, I have an interesting by the way for you, and you'll certainly relate to this, in fact, I will frustrate you in just a moment because you'll want to tell your story and I'm not going to let you. One of the judgments uh, that take place near the end of the tribulation period, the, the bold judgments, is that people will be killed with, this is interesting in light of God's message to us this morning, people will be killed with, with tremendously large hailstones. The biblical word is a talent, and scholars will, you know, um, suggest to you that that's somewhere between 75 and 100 pounds. Can you imagine being hit with a 75 to 100 pound hailstone? How many of you remember the hailstorm that we came through a couple of years ago? And this is where you're going to be frustrated because I'm telling you my story and I'm not letting you tell yours because I, I got to be to bed before midnight. Anna and I were coming through town um, to church, and wow, the, it just is such a vivid picture in our minds, and again, you'll be able to relate to this with your own personal story. But we were coming down Main Street, and all of a sudden we're looking at all of the flags that are on the sides of both of the roads, and I mean, they're just ready to come flying out of there, and, the, and, and it got so dark, I was impressed with the darkness, and then all of a sudden, we started hearing hailstones. We heard them before we identified what they were, and they started out probably about the size of a pea, and then they became the size of a dime, and then a nickel, then a quarter, then a golf ball, 
and then the one that broke through our back window and, through, and, and, and flew through the length of our Acadia and landed on the dash of our vehicle was the size of a hardball, a baseball. And I remember after that was done and we were here, we were licking our wounds and everything and praising God for his provisions and everything, but I, I was here and I didn't have all my windows kind of thing. And, you, and some of you lost your, your vehicles and, and some of you had hailstones. This is amazing to me. And again, it re reflect, re reflects back on God's message to us this morning. Some of the hailstones were coming down so fast and were so big that they literally ripped through your roof. I saw personally metal roofs where the hailstone had come right through the roof. Amazing. The bold judgment where hailstones are falling and um, they weigh a talent somewhere between 75 and 100 pounds. The scientists have taken a look at that. When it enters, um, our atmosphere, it will be traveling 284 miles per hour. I was curious about the size. The size of a 100-pound hailstone, when you compare it, because we've gotten as big, uh, boy, there's some discussion, uh, there, we, we have found um, hailstones, believe it or not, that have been up to eight inches in diameter. You can imagine that. But this hailstone will, be, will have a diameter of 29 inches. You need to think of a mountain bike tire. One of the judgments during the tribulation periods. Again, kind of like what we saw this morning happening in Sodom and Gomorrah. If that, that hits you, that is instantaneous, obviously. But you can imagine the destruction and the death. Bottom line is, it's one of the primary stories of the tribulation period. Remember, God is in the process, and there's a silver lining to this, which we'll see in just a moment. But God is in the process of pouring his rightful wrath upon the earth dweller. And death is a prominent theme, and the Apostle Paul reminds us of that succinctly here in verse 10. But, but here's the thing, and ultimately this will lead, it's still bad news, but this will lead to the silver lining. Many people are going to perish during the tribulation period, but Paul tells us why. Did you see that? Again, verse 10. And with all deceivableness of unrighteousness in them that perish, there they are dying. And here's why. Again, did you catch it? Because they received not the love of the truth that they might be saved. Why are they perishing? Because they received not the love of the truth. It's a simple observation, but I am prompted to make it with you tonight. The point that I'd like to make is if, is, if, is if they have received not the love of the truth, then that means that the truth was offered to them. Because you can't reject, and this is a pretty significant thing, especially with a view to hyper-Calvinism. You cannot reject something that has not been offered to you. Please see again the, the divine heart beating for the souls of men. Please see the seeking and saving God. Please see the long-suffering God. Please see the God of 2 Peter chapter 3 and verse 9 where the skeptic says, where is the promise of his coming? And Peter responds, God is not slack concerning his promise, as some men count slackness, but is long-suffering toward us, not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. Listen, God seeks to save all. Christ died for all. 
There is no one without, uh, outside of the reach of the divine mercy and grace of God. It's striking. Why are all of these people perishing? It is because they have not received the truth. I just see, and you, I, I know you don't tire of hearing this because it's one of God's great characters, but, he, but you hear it so often from Pastor Tom. Here is the seeking and saving and wooing God, the Holy Spirit of God still saving, not so much restraining, not through the church, but the Holy Spirit of God still very active in saving people, even during the tribulation period. God is pouring his wrath out on the earth dweller, and he's doing it with justice, and yet at the same time, he is seeking to save. What a God that is. And he has a powerful twofold witness, and, well, this is good news for you. It's not you. Don't you just love it that God's got it all worked out? Don't you just love it that God has told us about these things? Don't you just love it that God is so clear in regard to who's going to be there and who's not going to be there and whose job it is when they are here and whose job it isn't? Isn't it exciting that God, in the word of God, just spells all of these things out so that even a simple-minded man can understand and know Of course, you know that God's got a very effective witness during the tribulation period. Again, the seeking and saving God. That's why if you and I perish, I mean, even now in regard to this earthly sojourn of ours, it will not be because God hasn't done all that he needed to do in order for us to be saved, rescued, delivered, redeemed. It will be, it will be because we have rejected the truth. It will be because we've said no to the one and only Savior. It will ultimately be because we have desired life without God. And as we've so often said of late, that's what God ultimately will give the Christ rejecter. And it's called hell. But again, God desires for no one to go there. Isn't that interesting? And with a view to Matthew 25 and Christ's very own words, he didn't, he didn't, he, he, he didn't construct hell. For any of, any of us, but rather constructed it for Satan and for his demons. And yet, the Bible makes it explicitly clear that that's where the Christ rejecter goes. In the end, God gives you what you want. I would say again, sorry for the repetition throughout the day, but why would anybody say no? to the one and only Savior from sin. Thank you, Jesus. Thank, thank you, Lord. So he's got twofold witness, and you're getting a little carried away here with this stuff, and you thought that I didn't remember where I was, but it's a miracle. I did and do remember. He has a twofold witness. It's not you, neither one of them. He has 144,000, and please receive the literalness of this. I love what John does as he talks uh, uh, about them in Revelation chapter 7. He breaks it down into the 12 tribes of Israel, and he says that there will be 12,000 sealed and saved um, Jews from each of the 12 tribes. And then you do the math and you have 144,000 very effective witnesses during the tribulation period. Don't be offended by this, but because of the tone of the time, you are not needed. <laughs> if you were needed, you'd be there. But you're not needed. God's got a different witness. By the way, his witness now is us. But his witness then will be two, one, the 144,000 Jews, and then two, the, the two witnesses, and there's interesting discussion about who they are, and of course we all probably have our own opinion in regard to that, but the, 
two witnesses of Revelation chapter 11. Again, I must stress, isn't it interesting that at the very time that God rightfully is pouring his wrath upon the earth dwellers, he's still, as the wrath is unfolding, he's still seeking to save. Wow. What a God. And then I said our focus would be on um, the phrase, uh, by the way, we'll say a little bit more about what we've just said when we get to verse 11, which I, I, I believe will be next uh, time, uh, the Lord willing. I, I said I wanted to focus, on the, focus in on the phrase, all deceivableness of unrighteousness. Paul is succinctly stating what man gets from Satan now and what the Antichrist will give to man then. Nothing but deception. People in mass will be deceived during the tribulation period. We've been coming to grips with that. We've already noted, for instance, that Israel, and my heart breaks in regard to this because I, I have listened to recordings and videos of uh, of Jews um, communicating their passion concerning the Messiah, the coming of the Messiah. And of course we know that, that, the, that the nation at large is, is pretty much ready for him. And we talked a little bit about even some of the practical and logistical and physical preparations that they've already made in regard to that. I think I mentioned this to you, but Dr. Jimmy DeYoung was interviewing uh, a man from the tribe of Levi, and he was telling uh, Jimmy DeYoung that he's not only been fitted for his priestly garment, but that the priestly garment is hanging in his closet, and he anticipates that he'll be putting it on before too long. Israel will be certain that she has her Messiah. And the world at large will be certain that she has her Savior. But again, who she gets is the Antichrist. I didn't know whether I'd be reading you a bedtime story or not, but I, I, I brought my book and um, have this uh, paragraph that I'd like to read for you. B by the way, um, this comes from Countdown to Armageddon. It's uh, edited by uh, Charles Ryrie, um, features a lot of um, today's experts uh, dealing with prophecy. And this particular chapter was written by uh, Thomas Davis, and uh, I just want to read this short paragraph to you. He's speaking of the Antichrist. The title of the chapter is called The Abominable Antichrist. L listen to this. The Antichrist will strive for unity with a one-world religion, one-world economic system, and one-world government. In an effort to bring the whole world under satanic domination, the Antichrist will manipulate men through religion, economics, and government. It's fascinating. This is what I wanted you to hear. It's fascinating to note the desperation of 20th century man as far back as the 1950s Listen, in October 1957, the year some of us were born, Paul Henry Spake, Secretary General of NATO, said this in Paris, I'm quoting. I can't believe anybody, I, I can't believe anybody would say this, especially a prominent political figure. He said this back in 1957. We do not need another committee. We have too many already. What we want is a man of sufficient stature to hold the allegiance of all people and to lift us out of the economic uh, morass into which we are sinking. Send us such a man, and be he God or devil, we will receive him. Can you imagine a public proclamation like that? Going all the way back to 1957, 
the dark ages. <laughs> you remember that what Paul said a little bit earlier in verse 7, for the mystery of iniquity doth already work. You remember one of the practical applications we made of that, that it, it appears that Satan has always had somebody ready to go. Satan has always had somebody ready to go. I'm glad he doesn't know everything about God's plan. I'm very glad about that. But he knows a lot of things. And again, it's, it, it is amazing to me that he's always had somebody in place ready to go, which makes the answer to the question, do you think that the Antichrist is already alive, interesting? Because the answer to that question may have been since the time of Paul's writing, always yes. But we move from one potential antichrist to another potential antichrist to another potential antichrist because Satan, although he knows a lot, he doesn't know everything and so he's always has, he always has to have a man ready. So people in mass will be deceived. Again, this striking phrase, all deceivableness of unrighteousness. People in mass will be deceived during the tribulation period. Israel will be certain she has her Messiah. The world, the world will be certain that she has her Savior. But can I step back from that for just a moment so that we, we have a very uh, personal application of these things? I know I'm not telling you anything new, but it, it certainly is a good reminder this is absolutely true today. It's not only going to be true in that day, in that day which is yet to come, that people will be deceived in mass. It's, it's also true this very day. And it gets even a little bit more frightening when we recognize that, again, in measure, that has application to us even as God's people. I'm reminded of Wednesday night, I, God has been just impressing so many things upon my heart and all oh, the grave things that begin to unfold in our lives when we start walking away from the word of God. And oh, how quickly we can be deceived. The world is deceived. And by the way, and we'll say more about that in just a moment if we have it, which I don't think we will. But boy, when you enter, you know, when you enter these gates, this is a different kind of world than when you exit. And when you exit, what you are facing out there is deception. And you can begin to see, I mean, it's quite a picture that God paints for us, because if we neglect the word of God, then we are neglecting the only source of truth, which militates against deception. And so once again, I have now uh, 2,001 reasons why I ought to be pursuing God and his word and doing so every day. Think about the current deception of sin and think about how it might actually relate to your and my life. I know this, it's one of the main reasons why we do it it's one of the main reasons why we sin. Because we've embraced the deceitfulness of the thing. It's why we embrace sin and it is also why it sometimes in a prolonged way holds us. Remember David warned us about harboring sin. If we regard iniquity in our hearts, David writes, he will not hear us. And so the, you know, we're, we're reminded of the potentiality of that. And again, it's frightening to think that you and I could be deceived. But that's what sin does. Oh, I have a couple of other things for you, but I don't think we can tackle that, I will take you back to last Wednesday and chapel at Calvary Christian Academy. I think it was this last Wednesday. Carrie, was Pastor Tom there last Wednesday? Yes, I'm going to take you back to last Wednesday 
Calvary Christian Academy Chapel. And the saying that we related to the kids, encourage them even to memorize it, that is appropriate for us tonight because it incorporates this idea of the deceitfulness and deceptiveness of sin. You're familiar with this. I always think of Brother Lynn Weston. I'm not sure why I think that I heard this from Lynn Weston, but I was already sitting on it from a previous source. And yet, because I, I held an, and hold Lynn Weston in such high regard, I just almost always think of him when I hear this. Sin will always take you further than you want to go. Sin will always keep you longer than you want to stay. Sin will always cost you more than you want to pay. I told our students, and some of them are pretty young, I said, oh, God has given us so many different motivations to not sin. And this is one of them tonight, the deceitfulness of sin. Don't buy into that. God help us. Let's pray. Lord, thank you for these considerations. We love our study. We, we love what you're teaching us. We love what the word of God reveals to us. We, uh, even though the details are tough, we, we have appreciated learning about the tribulation period broadly and specifically the Antichrist. And in, in the end, you, you have impressed us with what will mark that day in a full way, and that is deception, the deceivableness of unrighteousness. And yet we're prompted to recognize that that not only will be true in that future day, but there is in measure application of that to us today. So continue to impress these things upon our hearts, we pray for Jesus' sake. Amen. Let's stand together, take our hymnals, and turn to number 309. 309, we're going to sing the first and the third verses, When He Shall Come, 309. 